Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God fill you with joy today, even in the midst of all types of challenges. Would you join me in a prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, you are our perfect Heavenly Father. We give you praise and glory, thanking you for who you are and who you have made us to be, that we are your children, your people, and you promise that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, and bring us, Lord, through your Spirit today, that joy that you have for us, which passes all understanding and human reason, but fill us with that joy so that we might share that joy with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been going back to basics during this summer, uh, we're looking at some basic things about the Christian life and what it means to be living as a follower of Jesus and serving people with His love. And today, as we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, this is the second week of that. Do you guys remember what the first week was? The first fruit of the Spirit? So confident. I, you, you just breed confidence in me today that I just get through to you with every word. Let's try that again. What was the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Oh, so much better. And this week we've got? Joy. Okay. Boy, now I feel better. That was cleansing to hear you say that again. As we talk about joy and the fruit of the Spirit, as we look at that, we're going to take a look at God's Word and see what He has to say about that. But before we share His stories, I want to share a little bit of my story here from the past week. I don't know about you, but when I, when I saw and looked this week and I said, oh, I'm preaching on joy, I thought to myself, wow, I don't feel very joyful right now. Did any of you get that? You understand that? Yeah. You know, and I saw the headline in the Orlando Sentinel. It said that uh, the, um, this was the toughest week in the history of the city of Orlando, kind of with three different tragic things happening. And uh, I'm the type of guy who's really compassionate, really in tune with other people's emotions. And in some ways, uh, as I listen to people, I just kind of soak the emotions in. And I'm not always really good at cleansing those emotions. You know, I'm not the guy that you'll see just, you know, weeping. But I'll tell you, last week when I went home from here, I turned on um, XL1067 and was listening. Johnny's house crew was there in the middle of the afternoon on a Sunday. And they were given some of the best, if you can say it that way, news reports, most up-to-date reporting of any station that I'd scanned through. And as I listened, you know, I didn't get a full chance to really take in all that had happened on Sunday morning. As I'm driving home, I just start weeping. And I kind of have this thought that about 2.02 a.m. on Sunday, God's heart broke. And his heart broke for the people of Orlando and the families here. And so that brings me back to thinking, how can you have joy in the midst of all, all that's transpired? And really, the, the basis for joy isn't an emotion that we have. It's not the same thing as happiness, although it does have a lot of similarities. Happiness is related to circumstances. Something makes you happy. But in this, in this sense from God's Word, this theological sense, this God-centered sense, this Holy Spirit sense, joy goes beyond the circumstances because the circumstances are here and they are now, and they will not always be what they are. Joy does not deny the sadness that we might have, especially as I think through the years ministering to people who have lost a loved one. Those times of grief are not minimized. God allows us space to grieve. 
And yet the darkness of those moments of grief can never overcome the light of Jesus. And he is the one who brings us a true and lasting joy. It's rooted in who he is and what he has done for us and who he has declared us to be as children of God. His love, his forgiveness, with his peace also comes this joy. It's a settled thing. It's because the matter of our relationship with God has been settled by Jesus. And nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Still makes it hard to talk about joy, though. And so as we talk about joy today, we look at a a couple of stories that Jesus told, but we begin with where Jesus is. And I think even here in Luke chapter 15, if you've got a Bible, please open that and have that handy. Or if you're using an app on your phone or your tablet, we invite you to do that. Also, the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 10, 15, uh, 1 through 10, are printed for you in that insert in your worship folder. When you look at that, we see Jesus with people, and it is an amazing scene because as he's with people, you know, Jesus would be with people that would get him into trouble with some guys named the Pharisees. Those were like the religious watchdogs of their day. They were the ones who looked down at others to see, are you living a life that's good enough for God? And so when Jesus associated with people, with all people, because who did Jesus love? Everyone. He came to demonstrate God's love for the world, the whole world. And so Jesus, as he's spending time with tax collectors and people with a label, sinners. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, tax collectors were kind of seen as sellouts. If the people of God who lived uh, were people of the promise, the people of Israel were looking forward to God's promised Messiah, the Romans had messed everything up by coming in and occupying their territory. The tax collectors were in with the Romans because they collected the taxes that would go and get passed along to the Roman officials. And usually the way it worked was whatever you could get more than what you were required to pass on, you're the middleman, that's what you got to keep. So the tax collectors were kind of, kind of crooked. You know, they'll take you for what you got. Nobody really liked them. They were on the outside, in the sinners, people whose lives didn't look like they could be what God would want their lives to be. It was a label put on people when, in fact, when God looks at all humanity, this is why he sent his son for the world, because nobody would be good enough for God on their own. Nobody could clean up their act enough for God to say, boy, that person, I'm going to save them because they look like they got it together. That's not the way that works. Rather, it's a matter of grace. Jesus going to those who could never make themselves worthy. Boy, that's instructive for us, isn't it? As we look at our world today, as we could be tempted sometimes to think, well, you know, that person's life, no. It's a matter of that person needs the gifts that God has in Jesus. So the tax collectors and the sinners, Jesus is hanging with them. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're looking down their nose and they're muttering, this man cannot be a man of God. He's associating with the wrong types of people. And so Jesus got something to say about that. He says, let me tell you a story. He tells three, actually. We're only going to look at two because we know that we want to have this Hispanic dinner 
coming after this Father's Day dinner, right? You don't want me to be telling stories during dinner, do you? Work with me here, guys. So the first story that Jesus tells, a parable. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over one ninety-nine righteous persons who don't need to repent. Maybe we should say righteous persons who maybe think of their own righteousness, not the righteousness that they've gotten as a gift from God. So Jesus tells this story to make a point. First of all, he's kind of answering the attitudes of the Pharisees and teachers of the law and highlighting for them how their way of looking at things and how our way sometimes of looking at things, because naturally we kind of come at things this way. We make, sometimes we make judgment calls. Sometimes we are judgmental. It's just a part of life. That's why people on Facebook, you know, or on social media are just throwing darts at a parent who lost the handle on her kid and he ended up with a gorilla because people are making a judgment, maybe being judgmental. Or some people on social media, rather than grieving with a family that lost a two-year-old that uh, got caught by an alligator. Maybe a lot of people threw some darts and said, where was the parent? No, dad was fighting the gator trying to save his son's life. We see how that goes. Sometimes we fall into that pattern. And Jesus is saying, you know, that's not the way God looks at things. That's not the way heaven looks at things. Rather, truth be told, every single one of us has a need for God's love, his redemption, his forgiveness, and the new life that he longs to bring to, to us. And so Jesus makes this comparison. It's kind of like a guy, a shepherd. It could be a gal shepherd, I guess. A shepherd who's watching. They've got 100 sheep. One goes off. Now, those sheep are valuable to the shepherd. But it's not like the shepherd is sitting there saying, well, I got 99 still, and I'm going to get something at market for the 99. It's kind of risky for me to go after the one. Rather, the shepherd in the story that Jesus tells will go off looking for the one because that one sheep is valued so much. They can't be lost. And so the joy comes when that sheep is gathered up and put on the shoulders of the shepherd and that sheep is coming home. And the shepherd is joyful you know, I don't know much about shepherding or sheep. I've never lived on a farm. I did for a while live with a farm across a little creek in my backyard when I lived in Indiana. But I don't know much about sheep. But I've heard this. Sheep are stupid. <laughs> they are about as dumb an animal as you can get. I love me a good dumb dog. <laughs> but sheep are stupid. And they will just wander off. But I've also heard... That shepherds, when they care for their sheep, they know their sheep. You know, they know that this one's got that little notch out of their ear because it, it was frost that night and they got a little frost bit. They know that this one, you know, usually will just bleat and bleat and bleat away. This is the noisy one. They know this one. This is the one that wanders off and we have to keep a close eye on them. And we know that this one's just kind of all over the place in terms. Shepherds know their sheep, and they don't want to lose a one. In this message that Jesus gives, he says, when the sheep is found, there is more joy and rejoicing over one person who comes back home 
than over 99 who didn't feel like they needed to or who were always there. Jesus tells another story, talks about the, the, a woman who has 10 silver coins. She loses one. Now, those coins are valuable, aren't they? Maybe she needs them for whatever it is that she's going to buy at market. Maybe it's something that is valuable because it's decorative. It, it's something that uh, is ornate. She loses one of those coins. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully for that one coin until she finds it? You know, it wasn't enough for her to say, I've got nine coins still. Things are okay. She looks and searches diligently for that lost coin. And then Jesus ties this together. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus says, this is about rejoicing. It's about welcoming people home. It's not about trying to look and say, well, you know, we're better than you. Or, boy, can't you get your act together? Maybe if you get your act together, maybe God will love you. That's not what Jesus says. He says it's about God's love coming freely and changing lives. Now, what's the point with all that? Well, a productive spiritual life is growing in joy. First thing, God wants you and me to have joy. He wants us to celebrate all that he's done for us. He wants us to take that in, to remember that Jesus, when he died, if you were the only person, he would have died for you and for me and for all the world. And we've been joined with Jesus in our baptism. We've been made children of God, and that is what we are. We are God's people, blessed. Be joyful. Let that show in your life without denying the grief and the challenges. I'll tell you, this week there are days where I thought, I just don't really even want to interact with people. I felt a little bit that way yesterday. I went to the hospital to visit somebody, though, and what did I run into? The comfort dogs. The comfort dogs that come from all over the country. And I thought, I need this, me. I need God to take away those things that are burdening me and to fill me again with joy. Rejoice. You know, there's a lot of people in this world who are filled with sadness, some who are filled with bitterness, some who are filled with anxiousness, but not always a lot that you see who are filled with joy. But when you see somebody who's filled with joy, you see it, you feel it, you can tell. That makes us tremendous ambassadors of God when we're filled with joy. But there's also joy, not just in recognizing who you are, but there's joy in the finding, in the searching, because we know that it matters, it counts. You know, we had this big, uh, really big service, a prayer service on Wednesday over at Trinity downtown that we got to not only take part in, but help plan. And... Yeah, there are some people who probably would not darken the door of a church frequently who were there. They got invited there. There's joy in the searching. And I got to have some conversation with more than one person this past week. And some of those conversations are just openings to share God's love and His peace and his comfort. There's joy in sharing about Jesus because we know that in a world where there are so many challenges and difficulties, and even Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. My peace I give to you, 
but not as the world gives. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. With a message like that to share with friends and neighbors and co-workers and children, isn't that about the most joyful thing you could share? That Jesus has got this all covered. And he covers all of us with his love as he protects us and fills us with peace and joy. May you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit this week, including the love of Jesus radiating out from you and me and the joy that he brings us so that others might rejoice and that all heaven would rejoice as a message of God's love in Christ reaches many. In Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we take a moment to...